as I tend to do, I'm starting off tonight with a beer. This time it is, oh, yeah, uh, Capici, 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 I, I don't do Italian, I don't know. Uh, this is Cappuccino Milkshake Stout. It was brewed by Vessel Beer using the facilities of Nonsuch Brewing in Winnipeg. And contains coffee from Fools on Horses Coffee Roasters in Winnipeg. The artwork on the can is by Jesse Thiessen, who is getting 10 cents from every uh, can that's sold. That's kind of cool. These guys to support a local artist. Oh, man. Definitely stout. Definitely coffee. That's going to keep me awake. Which is good, because this is going to be a lengthy video, possibly. Back in Mailbag uh, 96, I got this 45-in-1 modules set here. Uh, it is sold as uh, companion modules or expansion modules or experimenter modules for Arduino or Raspberry Pi, I guess, but mostly Arduino-type stuff. And there is a lot of them. The first thing I can tell you about these is the way these ones were packaged, which was the cheapest way possible, of course, because cheapest way possible is how I do things. Um, they were packaged just in a bag rather than being packaged in some kind of a rigid case like they often are. So uh, that might not be the best way to buy these. You might want to, uh, if you have an option, if you're going to order one of these, you might want to get it in a... Uh, hard case just so that it doesn't come with components all mangled that's quite a lot of stuff uh, that you get in the set now then how useful are these for experimenting well um you could easily buy a lot of these things separately off the board but there's a little bit of a bulk price savings now then how uh are they going to be extremely useful having like three or four different leds couple of different reed switches, a couple of different uh, uh, variants on a microphone input. I don't know. Um, they're all slightly different operating modes, and I'm going to go through a bunch of them today. So one thing I'm going to have to stop and do for a bunch of these is just to straighten out the bent pins. As I said, if you buy these in a proper box rather than just a cheap bag like I did, they're less likely to come all damaged and bent. But this isn't all that difficult to fix anyway. So this here is the breadboard power supply. It can take uh, various input voltages and convert them to either 5 volts or 3.3 volts. And then it connects to a standard breadboard to put that power onto the breadboard. And you see the pins down there. Just go on like that. And those ones are bent. Just like that. So now the negative output is connected to the negative rail, the positive output is connected to the positive rail, and the same down here. You got a set of jumpers top and bottom here to select whether this set of rails is either 3.3 volts or 5 volts. Let's put that one on 3.3 volts. We'll leave this one on 5 volts. Now then, um, it is using linear regulators, uh, 1777s, I believe they are. Yeah, AMS 1777. One of them is a 3.3 volt version, one of them is a 5 volt version. So to power it, you just connect uh, a voltage higher than 5 volts to this barrel jack here. You can use, you know, a wall work like that. I'm just going to use this 9 volt battery for now. Ah, plug it in there. Power switch to turn it on. There we go. And it's got a convenient 5 volt USB output there. But more importantly, it's putting a voltage onto your breadboard. So let's connect something to that. Let's get one of these output modules here. Perhaps this one. This one appears to be an LED. Um, it's got three leads on it, so it's probably a two-color LED. Okay, so I'll just connect this guy in. Right now I'm on the 3.3 volt side. I've got ground connected to the first pin, the one on that side. And I'll connect this to the second pin with positive voltage. There's one color. And there's the second color. Let's try this LED module. This is an RGB LED. It's a 50-50 is the package. It's a three color RGB LED. 
So this one's marked. It's got negative on the right hand pin. So there, and the rest of them are marked as well. So that should be blue, red, green. So you can connect this, well, you can connect any of these because they seem to have the resistors built into them. Now you can connect any of these directly to the pins on an Arduino. And that's what they're for. You just use the uh, breadboard jumper wires such as that um, to connect them to the pins of the Arduino and uh, control them in software. Now I'm not going to write up a bunch of software for each and every one of these things, especially for the basic inputs and outputs, but any digital output from the Arduino can drive one of these things directly. Don't drive all of them together because there's a limited amount of current that you can put out of the Arduino, but for just basic indicators and whatnot, there you go. So here's another RGB LED from the pile. It's similar to the other one, um, different package, but same functions, minus voltage, red, green, and blue, blue, green, red. Now this little board has two components on it. It has an LED and a mercury tilt switch. There's the uh, just ground and LED power. And if you put the ground wire on the switch lead, then when you tilt it, the little tilt switch turns that LED on and off. Tilt switch is an old school mercury tilt switch. So when you tilt it, watch a little blob of mercury, it moves and it's no longer making contact between the two wires in there. Yes, that is actually a little blob of mercury. I'm not sure how they export those from China without getting caught, but there it is. It's perfectly safe as long as you don't break the glass thing, and it's a fairly solid little glass thing. There is a mercury tilt switch just on its own. That's, oh, and it looks like it's got a little LED and a resistor on the board there. Let's see what happens. The switch and LED combination are on the left terminal and the middle terminal. Tilting that, it goes out. That's just a standard little push button switch. I don't think there's much to explain about it. These two are reed switches, which are a magnetic switch. So here's a reed switch just from my collection, a little bit bigger one. As you can see, it's just a little glass tube with two pieces of uh, metal in there. And when a magnet gets close, it closes the circuit. These things are used a lot in uh, burglar alarm and that kind of stuff. So here is this little guy. I've got plus and minus voltage uh, connected up to it. And the digital output I've just got going to that LED over there. You see when the magnet gets close, the voltage uh, the LED goes on and that LED goes on. This one is the same thing just without the amplification. It's just a switch, just like I showed you with my standalone switch. Next thing, this little switch here, looks like it's got a spring in a tube, which has been all skewed by the shipping. So you can see just at the top there, there's a little metal contact and then there's this spring here. And when it moves around, that spring knocks into the metal contact to tell you if the thing has been jostled around. This one appears to have beaten up pretty bad in shipping, but that's what that one does. This is a different kind of a vibration sensor. So this guy has a spring, a coil spring wrapped around a solid little pin there. And when it gets a whack, it makes contact very, very briefly, as you can see on that LED back there. This little laser module, just like so many of the others, it's hooked up plus and minus voltage, and there we have a little laser diode. Like any laser, don't stare straight into it, but it's not that powerful. It's not going to hurt you uh, unless you burn your eyes out or something. So just a little bit careful, but they can be fun to play with. And I've got a project that I did with these guys. Uh, I'll link it somewhere. Actually, I'll link down in the description to any project that I've done with any similar device like any of these. They're all kind of fun to play with, though. And this one is just a standard... Oh, it's not a standard blue LED. This is a multicolor flashing LED. Okay. Self-flash LED, they call them. That one's the fast flash. This one's another dual color LED. Red and green again. 
uh, common cathode. The negative is the common, the positive is the one that uh, changes here. So this little module calls itself a heartbeat sensor. And it is uh, basically an infrared emitter and an infrared receiver. Um, this one is not soldered together the way most of the examples online that I've seen are. They should be pointing kind of at each other and then you put your finger sort of in between them. And the Arduino is reading the analog output voltage from this thing. And if we look at the serial plotter and if I hold my fingers still, you can sort of see it bumping up and down a little bit with my pulse. You could easily do some math on, on that and actually come up with a number for the pulse, but not for this demonstration. Now let's take a quick look at these uh, style of boards. They've all got some sort of an analog sensor on them and an amplifier and a little bit of amplification. Um, they've got a digital out and an analog out. The digital out will uh, trigger uh, 5 volts or 0, depending on whether this thing is active or not, and that will turn that little LED on. That's with a threshold crossing. And then the analog uh, output voltage, depending on which sensor you've got, will give you either an analog voltage or a high and a low on the analog, again, depending on which sensor. There's an LED there which lights up uh, when you've crossed your threshold and a power LED. So here's the flame sensor wired up, uh, analog voltage over there, digital output over there. Okay, so this is one of the two microphones. I'm not sure what the difference between the two of them is other than the physical size of the microphone. And again, you can adjust the threshold. You can either have it as a digital or an analog. Hey, mm, one, two. Hello, one, two. And mostly this is just for triggering uh, things. It's not an actual microphone. So a noise sensor, really. Here's the smaller of the two uh, sound sensors with the microphone on it. The only difference is the actual microphone. It works exactly the same. Hey, one, two. They're not super sensitive, but if you make enough noise right close to them, they'll trigger. This board is one of the several temperature sensors in this kit. This is an NTC thermistor. It is a resistor whose value changes based on the temperature. And again, like all the similar boards, it has a little threshold and whatnot. But if we warm this up, watch the analog voltage or the analog uh, value changing and it's just crossed its threshold. You see the digital happen. If I let it cool off. It should, yeah, it's coming back up here. And you can calibrate that if you choose to. Again, for this demonstration, I haven't bothered to. And there the threshold's crossed again. So there's another NTC thermistor in the kit. This one's just the thermistor itself with no other circuitry. I'm just measuring resistance here now. And if I warm it up with my fingers, you see the resistance changing. Yeah, same thing. Um, you can use that just directly into the analog input or any other place that you need a variable resistance for, for uh, temperature. Next in we have this one, which looks like it's got a transistor on there, but really that is a Hall effect sensor. A Hall effect sensor is a magnetic sensor. So when the magnet comes close, see this LED comes on, my digital output comes on over there, and my analog voltage swings. And again, this, I don't know if this is, yeah, it is proportional. See the analog voltage changing based on how close my magnet is. And again, you can set the threshold of the digital with uh, with this. I may have said earlier that this adjusts the gain of the analog output. I don't think it does. I'm pretty confident that this adjusts mostly the threshold. And the last of this style of sensor board is this one, which calls itself a touch sensor. Again, it has what looks like a transistor at the front, but this time it looks like a transistor because it actually is. The base input is folded up over there and it's set up in a fairly high gain configuration so that when you touch that base lead, that's what triggers it. Nothing super complicated, but it could be handy. There's other ways of doing a touch switch, but this is a fairly simple way of doing it. Next in, we have this little relay module. Now a relay basically allows you to use a small voltage to control a much higher voltage and or current. Um, in this case, 
we have the relay being controlled by a small transistor down here, that one right there, and that allows you to use a negligible amount of current, such as you can get from a microcontroller's uh, uh, digital output pin, to drive the relay because the relay coil draws a little bit more power than you want to be pulling out of a uh, Arduino pin. So we have plus and minus voltage coming straight from the power supply. And then we have our signal line, which would be coming from the microcontroller if I chose to hook one up. And that activates the relay. Here's the common pin in the middle, normally closed. There's no signal on it. That's this one. When I put the signal on, that goes away. And now the normally open is closed because it's not normal anymore, it's energized. Got it? Good. Next we have the two little buzzers. One is called an active buzzer. That's this one here. One is called a passive buzzer. That's this one. Um, the passive buzzer is essentially, well, it is exactly a speaker. That's all it is. So you have to put a signal into it, um, a waveform of some kind for it to make noise. The active buzzer, you just have to give a voltage. And it's quite loud, but it doesn't have the sticker on it. This little guy here is a tilt switch. There's a little ball, a little metal ball inside there. And when it rolls around, it makes contact. I mentioned this quickly in the beginning, but this is a variable resistor, a light dependent resistor, or LDR. Sometimes it's called a CDS cell, which is cadmium sulfide cell, which is the chemistry of it. But that doesn't matter so much. It's a resistor who changes based on the amount of light coming on it. That's resistance over there. Make it dark. Make it really dark. That, yeah. And then put it in the light. Goes down to 300 and some ohms. So these two are two different Hall effect sensors. Um, this one here is the same one that's on this board. However, it's just all by itself and you connect it up uh, like so many of these things, negative, positive, and the signal output. And its output changes based on this uh, magnet being close to it. You notice when I flip the magnet over, this polarity of the magnet sends the voltage low when it gets close. And I flip the magnet again, and this polarity causes its, its voltage to go higher then it's neutral. So that's kind of interesting, can tell you uh, which polarity your magnet is and if it's close or not. Meanwhile, this other Hall effect sensor, if you come in from one side, it lights up. If you flip the magnet around though and come in from that side, it doesn't. But then with that magnet still flipped, you come in from this side. Actually, no, you flip it around to its original orientation. You come in from this side, and it senses. So it can sense from both sides, but only one polarity of the magnet. And the board's got a little resistor and LED on it too. So that's slightly different and its voltage doesn't vary. It just snaps on and off. Whereas that first one that we saw, it had a variable voltage. Next in randomly pulled from the pile, we have this little joystick module. I think I've showed you this joysticks before, but anyway, this one's got two potentiometers, one for horizontal, one for vertical, or X, Y, as you prefer. And it's got a little switch here, so when you click down the button, the switch activates. And just like any other variable resistor, its resistance changes when you move it. So I'm in the Y right now, so there we go. This rotary encoder is an interesting thing. It... You, it looks like a potentiometer, but it isn't. It's not a variable resistor. It is two little switches set a certain set of uh, degrees apart. And as you turn it, one or the other or both or neither are activated onto the output. I've got an entire video about uh, these things that I'll put a link to rather than going into uh, too much uh, detail and spending too much time on it right now. It is a handy little thing, though. Oh yeah, and it's got a little clicky switch on it too. This is sometimes called a raindrop sensor or a water sensor. 
it basically has a transistor there and a couple of resistors and then these tracks etched into the circuit board ah even on the back it calls it a water sensor okay so when this thing sees a drop of liquid on there its output voltage goes up and the amount of liquid on there will have an effect on what the output voltage is if there's not very much on there it's a lower output voltage in a similar vein there is this which is a soil moisture sensor you jab those spikes down into the dirt of your plant pot or your garden or whatever and it will give you an analog value coming out to give you a relative indication of how moist your soil is again i've got a full video on this and another type of soil moisture sensor which i will link you to so that i don't have to spend a whole bunch of time uh, making this thing work tonight this one is an infrared receiver typically used with remote controls i've got it hooked up to my uno here and i've got a demo sketch from the ir receive library and i've just got a random infrared remote control it doesn't come with one but i'm going to push a few buttons and we'll see what happens so there you can see the Arduino is decoding and displaying the uh, data based on those buttons. So you just take that information, those hex codes, and put that into your sketch to control whatever it is that you want to do. This module is the DHT11 uh, temperature and humidity sensor. The pinouts on it are slightly different than the rest of them. Uh, ground is on the right, power's in the middle, power's almost always in the middle. And the signals over here and this one is labeled minus is over there and signals over there so i've got my arduino connected here and just pop up the serial monitor and there it is it's reading 29 degrees celsius and 49 percent humidity which is humidity is close but the temperature might be a bit high these aren't the most accurate of temperature sense in the world but they're not bad for a rough idea and just generally getting a trend i'm using something very similar in my uh, beer fridge monitoring project that I did a while ago, which also uses something very similar to this one, the SD card reader. I, the one that I used is micro SD card, but it's very, very similar. So the SD card reader, again, there's a library. Um, so many of these things, there are libraries available f through the Arduino IDE. This one uses Mozzie Miso, uh, chip select and serial clock to talk to the Arduino it can be either 3.3 or 5 volts but then you can either read from this or you can write to this and use it as a data logger which is how I've used it um, but you can also read configuration and whatnot off here if you choose to write a program that uh, that needs a whole bunch of data read in or something like that but data logging is what most people use these things for Next, we have three different uh, optical proximity sensors. This particular one is the beam break sensor. So if something come, uh, goes in the slot there and breaks the beam, then you see the output on my little blue LED back there. This one is one of the two different reflective mode sensors. There's an infrared LED and an infrared sensor here side by side with a little piece of plastic in between them so they can't see each other very well. We have a threshold adjustment. And when your object gets close, this LED on, on here goes on and your output goes low. Um, the output is connected to the middle pin. This one's handily labeled, not all of them are. There you go, you can tell if something's getting too close. And again, I'm, I've got some old videos on my model railroad using something very similar to this to detect the position of trains. And this is the other infrared uh, detect air proximity detector. Um, you can see it activating when this uh, passes through here. These two pots are basically for sensitivity. They're not labeled, so just fiddle around with them. Now this particular one um, it calls itself an IR08H, and it's relatively common. You can find them online, but every single one that I can find online uses a 555 chip on it. This particular one uses a 74HC00. Um, so I'm not quite sure what the difference is, but 
it still works the same. You can still get an output when it detects something in front of it. Ultrasonic distance sensor. Again, this one I'm not going to hook up because I've got an entire video on it, which is linked below. But essentially, it just uses sound waves to tell you the distance that an object is from it. And it will give you a distance in meters or feet, depending on how you do your math. Very handy. A lot of uh, robot projects use this so that it knows how close it is to a wall or something like that. Basically, it just sends an ultrasonic sound out this speaker and times how long it takes to echo back into the receiver. We're getting into the fancier modules now, even though this one doesn't look like it. This one just looks like a normal little transistor, but really it is a one wire temperature sensor. One wire because it both transmits and receives on a single wire and there are ways of configuring it so it, it can also get power off that same wire. So you only really need ground and one wire. Although in this case I am using uh, two wires just because it's easier for this uh, module. So I've got it hooked up to my demo Arduino here and we'll just see what happens when we hook it up using of course a demo sketch from the library. And there it is, reading from the temperature sensor, um, 26, 27 degrees. If I put my fingers on it to warm it up a little bit, and you see it's starting to climb up again. Nice little temperature sensor. And these ones will run on a fairly long uh, cable away from the device. So if you want to uh, extend your temperature monitoring a fair distance away from your Arduino, this is one option. And so this one is a, a real-time clock module based on the 1302 chip. There's a few different real-time clock modules, but this is one of the uh, most common and least expensive ones. And it only has three components. It's got the chip itself. It has a crystal oscillator, or a, a crystal that acts as its oscillator, as its reference. And it has a battery holder. Nothing on the back. So if we put a battery in there... It will remember its time when the thing's unplugged or disconnected. I've got a demo sketch loaded up. Plug the Arduino in and and here we go. It is showing the current time on there. 11.06, which matches what my computer's time is. Because that's what happens with this particular demo sketch. It uh, sets, the, if the time's not already set on the thing, it sets the time for it. But now that we've got a battery in there, I'm going to disconnect the power to the Arduino for a while. And I'll come back and we'll see what it says. Why we're letting that clock just tick away with no power on it. And actually, you notice there's no power lights on the Arduino. So we'll just let that go for a while. Let's take a look at uh, this little buck converter, a DC to DC converter that came with it. Um, it's just very simple. You connect your voltage to the in and your whatever you want to power to the out. This one will take a higher voltage and reduce it to a lower voltage. So right now I've got about 9 volts coming into it. And its output is 8 point something volts. But there's this little adjustment potentiometer right here. So you can set it down to under one volt or whatever voltage you want and it's a little bit twitchy to adjust it's not the highest quality potentiometer but once you've got it where you want it it'll stay there and uh, you can use that to power your projects off a voltage other than the voltage that the projects like to have and the last module in the set is this little gyroscope module um, it on the back it calls itself an MPU 6050, on the front it calls it a GY521. Regardless, um, it can sense its horizontal and vertical and uh, position, whether it's tilted one way or the other. It can sense acceleration in three dimensions, and I believe it can sense rotation as well. Um, so I've loaded up a demo sketch that I found into good old Arduino. This one only needs four wires. It needs power and it needs uh, the I2C, uh, so SCL and SDA. So right now I've got it sitting 
upright or flat, I guess. I'll tilt it onto its side there. I'll roll it this way. I'll bring it back upright again. Neat little thing. I have to play with that more one of these days. As usual, I got this kit on uh, eBay. Um, there's a reasonable search term if you want to find something like it. They're not that expensive. I mean, $21, that's less, almost half a dollar per module. That's not too bad if you want to uh, uh, bulk out your experimenter kit quickly. There's also the uh, baby brother to it, the 37-in-1 kit. A lot of these come packaged a little bit nicer than the uh, than the bag that I got it in. And it's almost all the same modules. There's only a few different ones between most of the kits. And most of these have exactly the same modules in them. Matter of fact, I went through the, uh, the common 37-in-1 kits and the 45-in-1 kit that I got. And everything that's in the 37-in-1 kits is in this 45-in-1 kit. Slightly different names maybe, but they're all there. But here are the ones that the 45 and one kit has that the others don't the real time clock module, the water level module, AKA the raindrop module, um, the soil moisture module, the ultrasonic sensor, the breadboard power supply, which comes in handy. Um, the gyroscope, which is a neat little one, the buck power converter and the ST card reader module. So those are basically the difference between the 37 and one kits and the 45 and one kits. So there we go. There's just a brief introduction to 55 different modules that you can use and experiment with your, with your Arduinos or your projects. Now, mo all of these are available individually, of course. Um, most of these types of things are available just as a standalone item, not on the board. Uh, but these boards make it really easy to plug into uh, jumper wires and just try them out. So a lot of these same modules come with a lot of starter kits. I haven't seen a starter kit that's got all of these modules, um, but most of them have some assortment of these. So if you've already got an Arduino starter kit, uh, this may or may not uh, be interesting to you. If you've got a small Arduino starter kit, because again, some of them come with just, just the Arduino and a couple of breadboards and a few small things. Um, this might be right up your alley to expand what you've already got. I don't know. Um, anyway, there it is. Um, this is more aimed at beginners just to give you sort of an overview of what comes in one of these kits in case you were curious. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, thanks for watching. Comments and questions down below as usual in the comment section. I'll talk to you later.